Psalms chapter number 2. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall He speak unto them in His wrath and vex them in His sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with the rod of iron, thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye kings, or ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest He be angry, and ye perish from the way when His wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in Him. Amen. The main theme of the Bible is the kingdom of God. It is the motif that runs through all the pages of Scripture. And when we consider the kingdom of God, God's kingdom, it is a glorious subject to consider. It is characterized by righteousness, joy, and peace. And truly, the kingdom of God is a blessing for any human to be able to participate in. But unfortunately, the story of human history tells us of a humanity that has consistently displayed nothing but hostility towards God and His kingdom. And this is the message of our psalm. The hostility, the enmity that man displays towards God and His, his King. Now the first two Psalms really go together. Psalm chapter 1 and Psalm chapter 2. They stand together as pillars, as, as pillars to uh, enter into this great book of the Psalms. And I want you to notice the connection between these two chapters. Back in chapter 1, we, we see Psalm chapter 1 begins, Blessed is the man. Blessed is the man. And the blessing pronounced there is a conditional blessing. It is a blessing uh, to those that do not accompany with sinners, and a blessing to those that do uh, go down the path of righteousness. Uh, the first psalm establishes that there, is, that there are really only two paths of life. There is the path of curse, cursing, and there is the path of blessedness. But when you turn to chapter number 2, Psalm 2, the message adds to the message that we read in Psalm chapter 1, and that is that you must be extremely careful in the path that you choose. Because the path that you choose will determine your eternal destiny. We see the connection between these two chapters. Again, Psalm 1 begins, Blessed is the man. And these two psalms are connected because at the end of chapter 2, we see again that phrase used, Blessed are all they that put their trust in Him. Again, this is about the path of blessedness. And humanity has one of two paths to choose. And that is either the path of blessedness or the path of terrible condemnation. Now before we jump into the psalm before us, let me note that there are two fulfillments to this psalm. There is the ultimate fulfillment of this psalm, and then there is the immediate or near uh, fulfillment of this psalm. The near or immediate, immediate application of this psalm is of David, King David, over the children of Israel, people of Israel, at the time that this psalm was written. He was anointed by God to be their king, and the enemies of God were rising up against the anointed of God, King David. But the ultimate and primary fulfillment of this psalm is not of King David. It is of King Jesus. That is really who the psalm speaks of. And there are things in this psalm that we will look at that can be said of both David and Jesus. But there are also things in this psalm that really do not speak of David at all. They only speak of King Jesus. So I would submit to you that, and, and for most of our time this morning, we're not even going to consider David. Because this psalm is really not about David, it's about Jesus and His kingship over this earth and over this universe. Look with me at verse number 1. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? To begin this psalm, the psalmist notes the absolute rage that the heathen have worked themselves into. They have produced a frenzy. They have worked themselves into a frenzy. They are like the waves on a stormy sea. They are like the ants that have just had their nest and their, their, their home disturbed. They are in a rage. They are distressed. They are angry. They are bothered. 
Not only are they in a rage, but the psalmist notes that they are imagining a vain thing. Now, Psalm chapter 22, 21, and really all throughout Scripture tells us, if you, if you want to do a word study, study, I would suggest that you do. When you consider this word imagine in the scriptural context, it is rarely, if ever, used in a positive connotation. It is almost always, if, if not always, a negative thing. Psalm 21 tells us, For they intended evil against thee, they imagined a mischievous device which they're not able to perform. Genesis 6, 5, talking about the people, God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And we really could spend all of our time this morning running the reference references of the word imagination throughout Scripture. We won't do that this morning because we could spend all of our time doing it. But you just have to believe me this morning that when the Scripture uses this word imagine, it's not a good thing. It's not something that mankind is doing in a good way. And so what is this imagination? What is this rage that the psalmist speaks of? It is the desire of man to sin. It is the desire of you and me to do that which is against and contrary to God's Word and His law. And so Psalm, the psalmist David asked the question to begin this psalm, why do the heathen rage? Why are they so upset? Why are they so distressed? Why are they so, so angry? And make no mistake, though the first verse uses the word heathen, uses the word people, this is not just talking about the peoples in the faraway jungles. This is not just talking about the pagan tribes that we would think are uncultured and unreasonable. This is talking about the history of humanity. This is talking about the uncivilized and the civilized. The uncultured and, the, and those that have, that have culture. And you know, we really can observe this in our world today. Can we not say along with the psalmist, why do the heathen rage? Why is there such an uproar in our world? Why are people so distressed? Why are people so mad? I would submit to you that this psalm is more contemporary to you and I than, than tomorrow's newspaper, than the evening news channel. Uh, our world is in an upheaval. It is in an uproar. It is distressed. It is angry. It is raging. And when you look at verse number 2, the psalmist continues the thought. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together. And stop right there. You know, the leaders of this world can't get along about anything. They can't agree on anything. Economically, politically, socially, you, you name it, they can't get along. But on this, the psalmist says they come to, to unison and, and, and to right. agreement. And what is it that they have joined together in alliance together to do? What is it that they have taken counsel together to do? And we see it in verse 2 and 3. They take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. In verse number 1, the heathen are raging and they are imagining a vain thing. In verse 2, the kings set themselves uh, they take counsel together. What are they taking counsel together? What are the heathens raging? What are the people imagining, uh, vainly imagining? And all of these people around the world are in unison in an uproar against God and against His anointed. Why are they, say, why are they so angry? They give us the reason in verse 3. Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. You know, there is something deep inside the, the heart of mankind that knows that God is king. And that He is the ruler of this universe. And they must rebel against His authority. They must break the bands of His authority and His rulership. Uh, they must cast away the cords of God from, from their lives. And instead of submitting to Him, this world attempts to commit deicide. They attempt, to, they attempt an insurrection against God Almighty and against His anointed. This world wants nothing more than to erase the memory of God from this earth. They would love for His influence to be removed and to be wiped off the face of the earth. And this really has been the perpetual desire of humanity ever since the fall. What caused God to destroy the world with the flood, save one family? It was the evil imaginations of man continually. What provoked God to scatter the, the, the people across the earth and, and to confuse their language? It was their vain imaginations. We skip forward a few thousand years to when the Lord Himself was on this earth. 
And what caused the religious leaders to, 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 to want to crucify him? And what caused the Gentile pagans to relent and, and crucify the Lord Jesus? It was in unison they wanted to rid this earth from God and His authority. We skip forward even again to something that has yet to occur in the book of Revelation, what God has prophesied of in His Word. In Revelation 17, we see the kings of the earth gather themselves together. They take counsel one to another. They join an alliance under the Antichrist. Why? To rid the earth from God Almighty and from His, His anointed. All of human history shows this rebellion of humanity against God and His anointed King. And if you don't see this attitude in the world today, you are blind. This attitude exists, dare I say, more so today than perhaps ever before. It is as relevant today as it has ever been in history. When you see the world acting and saying today, know that it comes from a fundamental rebellion of God and rejection against His Word. When you see people that believe in evolution, know that it is not because they believe in evolution necessarily. It is because it is an alternative explanation to the scriptural uh, authority and the origins of the world. It's not so much that boys think that they're girls and girls think that they're, that, that they're boys. It's that they do not want to be subject to what God made them. It's not so much that homosexuality is to be natural. It is that they do not want to submit to the standard for the home that God has outlined. It's not so much that abortion is actually about a woman's choice. It is about a child bearing the image of God and they want to rid this world from God's image upon this earth. And I'm not suggesting that everyone that participates in these evil activities, and, and we could go on, is actively trying to defy God Almighty and, and, and the God of Heaven. Because that's not the case. But all of this foolishness, all of the sinfulness, all of the, uh, the sinfulness that we see upon this world comes from a fundamental rebellion against God and rejection of His Word. And that's where our world is. They are in upheaval. They are in active rebellion. They are in insurrection against the God of heaven and His anointed King. So what does God think about this? What does God want to do? Is God pacing up in heaven, wondering how He can soothe the crowds? Is He biting His nails trying to figure out how He can come to a compromise with the wicked? That's not what He's doing at all. Verse 4 tells us what the Lord is doing. And frankly, it's terrifying. Look with me at verse 4. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. He shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Again, the Lord's response here is terrifying. He is laughing at them. This is not a jovial Santa Claus-like God up in the heavens laughing with a ho-ho-ho. This is God Almighty with the laugh of scorn laughing at the wicked. The end of the verse tells us that, that the Lord shall have them in derision. Derision is very similar to the idea of scorn. And the idea is that the Lord is in heaven, sitting in the heavens, unbothered by their sin, but He is scorning them. He is laughing at them. He has them in derision. And this is the imagery that we get of God. Again, he is, he, is up in the, he is up in the heavens and He is looking down on the armies of men like a bunch of puny ants. Like what can they effectively do against God Almighty? They can do nothing. They can do nothing against Him. Look at verse 5. Then shall He speak unto them in His wrath. Now notice, the Lord does not lift a finger because He does not need to lift a finger. When the Lord speaks a simple word, Really, a simple, slight breath is enough to eliminate God's enemies. He speaks unto them in His wrath and vex them in His sore displeasure. The psalmist notes there, notice that, that word, He will vex them. He will vex His enemies. And the idea of vex, vexation there, is, it carries the same idea of oppression or persecution. You think about Lot, as Second Peter tells us about Lot when he was uh, living in Sodom that his righteous soul was, was, uh, was vexed day by day. His soul was oppressed by the wickedness that he saw and witnessed in Sodom. Or in Acts chapter 12 of King Herod, we read when he persecuted the church, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex 
certain of the church. There's a persecution there. So there is an oppression there. There is a persecution there. So when the psalmist speaks of God vexing his enemies, he is oppressing. He is persecuting his enemies. Boy, that is a terrible thought, is it not? And when we think of God vexing His enemies, I, I think there's really two primary ways that we can think of God vexing His enemies. First of all, consider that sin is self-evidently stupid. It's stupid. Right. Right. Sin will make you stupid, as Chris Simpson has, has been quoted to say. And God has made it such that sin is naturally stupid. Uh, it, it, produces, uh, it produces a result that is hard, that is tough, that is difficult uh, to, to live with. You know, the man or woman that produce an, uh, pursues an adulterous relationship is, an, is exchanging a momentary a moment of pleasure for a lifetime of heartache. Uh, the, the man who lets his anger control him is, is damaging his relationships beyond repair. The person who is controlled by covetousness cannot ever be satisfied. The person who is a consistent liar destroys his reputation. The person who is addicted to drugs or alcohol is damaging their body beyond repair. The young man who looks at pornography is destroying his soul. How is it that any of that is a good idea? How is it that we, that, that we can look at sin and think, you know, that is really tempting. Sin is self-evidently stupid. As the proverb says, the way of the transgressor is hard. Sin is always short-sighted. It is never looking to the long term. It is always exchanging the valuable for the quick and the cheap. The eternal for the temporary. And I believe God has made it so that the path of unrighteousness is hard. It produces a consequence in your life that is hard to deal with. And we've all dealt with that. We've all dealt with the heartache that sin, that sin produces even in our own lives. But we've all seen people that go through this life and they live it up for themselves. They sin. And they seemingly get by without the consequences. And, and perhaps we've even seen people that have been placed in a position of power where they themselves have oppressed and persecuted others. And it seems like they live a peaceful, uh, albeit sinful, life. How is it that that can be just? How is it that God can be fair in all that? Well, be not deceived. God is not mocked for whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. God is not finished with him yet. If the vexation that God inflicts upon his enemies uh, is only, this, uh, only upon this earth, uh, then we might have reason to suggest that God is not just. But we have no reason to suggest that because his vexation after this life is nothing in comparison to the vexation that sin produces naturally in the course of life. Because when, when Psalm 2 talks about the vexation that God brings upon His enemies, He is speaking about an eternal vexation. He is speaking about an eternal oppression, eternal persecution of His enemies. And with absolute certainty, we can be assured that the enemies of God will face a vexation forever. And that vexation that they face will be unlike any oppression that any man has ever faced on this earth. It will be unlike anything that any, that any human has ever imagined. This is God Almighty we are speaking about. The vexation that He can bring upon a soul is unlike anything else you've, you, you can ever endure. And you know, sometimes we get a little, a little uncomfortable with this side of God. But let's be, let's be real for just a moment. This side of God, if you want to call it that, is just as fundamental to the gospel as the love of God is. Without the holiness and justice of God, there is no gospel. And, 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 and by the way, this is a far cry from smile, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. But this is reality. I mean, this is the Word of God. This is what the Word of God teaches us. And, and heaven forbid that we ignore or, or try to apologize for what the Word of God says. Uh, far from it. The truth is, if you do not submit to this king, you will face an eternal vexation unlike anything you've ever faced before. And this is what the Bible says of the sinner. This is what the Bible says about his enemies. Psalms 7-11, God is angry with the wicked every day. That's not a day. That's not a moment in time. That is every day. That is today, God is angry with the wicked. He is angry with those that are opposed to Him. 
Psalms 5.5. 5. Again, I didn't write this. This is the Word of God. Right. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. Right. You know, we love to say that God loves the sinner and hates the sinner, hates the sin. That's not what he said in his word. Yeah, right. He said he hates all workers. He hates all workers of iniquity. Now, now I know, by no means am I trying to say that God does not love the sinner. I know that God loves the sinner. But let's not have a misunderstanding about the character of God. He will execute justice on his enemies. When the Lord flings people into an eternal lake of fire, He will not do so with a tear in His eye like some would like to suggest. He will do so with anger. He will do so with hostility. He will do so with justice and with vengeance being poured out upon His his enemies. You know, on one hand, He does love the world. And He proved it, did He not? By sending His Son to die for us. He loves the world beyond any, any potential love that you can have for anybody else. But on the other hand, He is righteous. And He is just and He is holy. And He hates those that are opposed to Him. And that's exactly what Psalm Psalm chapter 2 tells us. This is the God that we read about in Psalms 2. He is sitting in the heavens. He is laughing at His enemies. He is looking to execute justice upon His enemies. Look at verse number 6. We see in verse number 3, the people have said, let us break their bands asunder. And now in verse 6, God responds, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. He has established his king. Their plans have not altered his plans one iota. He has established his king. You notice that this is the father's king. Yet have I set my king. It is the father that has established his reign and rule over all the universe. The son rules for the father. The king is established as the saint's king. This king reigns and rules over his people through his spirit with love and righteousness and joy and grace. But the king is also established as his enemy's king as well. His title is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Everything and everyone must come, must come under the submission of the Lord and must bow to him in obeisance and worship, uh, worship to him. Whether they want to or not, they will bow the knee. They will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Whether you like it or not, whether you accept it or not, Jesus Christ is King. Now we move to the third stanza of Psalm chapter 2, verses 7 to 9. And verse number 7 changes the speaker. In verse number 6, it is God the Father speaking, Yet have I set my King upon my holy hill of Zion. But in verse number 7, it is now the Son speaking to the Father, or speaking uh, instead of the Father. He says, uh, so just, just one, um, in verse number 7, I will declare the decree, the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee. Now, admittedly, this verse says some things that, that can make us a little uncomfortable. Let me just tell you right off the bat that this verse does not teach us that Christ ever had a beginning. Uh, Jesus Christ is co-equal with the Father. He did not have a beginning. He is co-eternal with with God the Father. And there is a false doctrine out there that teaches that Jesus Christ was the first creation of the Father. That is nonsense. That is is false doctrine. He had no beginning. But our text, it does seem to, uh, to reference a moment in time, this day, have I begotten thee? A moment in time in which uh, Christ was begotten, whatever that means. And of course, we would typically assume that to mean uh, in reference to one's origin, because that's t- typically how we use that. But fortunately for us, the New Testament quotes this verse, and it quotes it many times. But in one of the quotations of this verse, we really get an idea of what the psalmist is talking about. In Acts chapter 13, in fact, if you will turn, turn with me there, such an important passage of Scripture. In Acts chapter 13, Paul is preaching to his brethren in the flesh, the Jews. And in Acts chapter 13, verse 33, Paul says this in his sermon, God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that He hath raised up Jesus again. As it is also written in the second Psalm, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee. So here Paul is referencing Psalm chapter 2 and he references it in relation to the resurrection of Jesus. 
So back in Psalm chapter 2, we get an exclusive look into a conversation between members of the Trinity. We would not have insight into this conversation had not uh, God chosen to put it in His Word, but He did. And so we have a little bit of insight into this conversation that God had, uh, that the Father had with the Son. And the conversation happens after Jesus has resurrected from the dead and has ascended back up into the heavens. And the imagery, if you will, is of the earth pregnant. And after the third day, the sun rises and gives birth, uh, the earth gives birth, if you will, so to speak, of, uh, of the sun. And the sun arises uh, back to his father up in, up in glory and he, is, he receives his vindication, his glory, his victory. You know, if Jesus had not risen, if He had not accomplished His mission on the earth, He would not have risen from from the dead. His resurrection was the vindication of His ministry and mission being accomplished on the earth. And so when the Son rises from the grave and He ascends back into the heaven, the Father says, Thou art My Son, this day have I begotten Thee. Now we could consider the implications of this statement and this happening really for the rest of our time, we're not going to. The only thing I want to establish from this verse is the importance of the resurrection of Christ to His authority. Because what we've just read in verse number 7 goes with verses 8 and 9. The conversation is all together. We oftentimes hear verse 7 quoted, and it's quoted in the New Testament, but it goes with verses 8 and 9. And this is the rest of what, or we'll look at those verses in just, just one moment, but consider that the life and death and resurrection of, Christ, of Jesus Christ is Him securing the victory over His enemies. He conquered every foe that came, that came, over, that, that came against Him in this earth. In 1 Corinthians 15, we read a great passage of Scripture speaking of Christ's victory. Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And those verses could not have been written apart from the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then in Ephesians chapter 4, we had that uh, familiar passage of Scripture where it says of Jesus after He ascended, He led captivity captive. Now, there's a lot of debate about what that means. Uh, and we've had plenty of conversations about what that means here, here in our own, our own church. And I'm not going to comment on what that means because frankly, I'm not even sure what, what all it means when it says Jesus led captivity captive after He rose from the dead. But I do, know, uh, I do know what it sounds like. And it sounds to me like a king who has secured victory. Who has conquered his foe. It sounds to me like he won the victory at His resurrection. And in Psalms chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, we see the continuation of this conversation between the Father and the Son. This is the Son quoting... Uh, the Father's words to the Son. And this is what the Father said to the Son, Ask of me and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with the rod of iron, thou shalt dash, the, dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. This is the Lord God saying to His Son, You have accomplished the mission that I have sent you to accomplish. Here are the spoils of the victory. Now I have seen some, some churches use Psalms 2 verse 8, as a missions verse, as a, as a theme for the Great Commission, let me tell you, that's a mistake. Psalms 2.8 is not about the Great Commission. Uh, it is far from, the, far from the Great Commission. There's a lot of verses to use for the Great Commission. Uh, Psalms 2.8 is not one of them. Because the nations as an inheritance for God, for Christ, is not an inheritance of faith and of those that have been transformed and born again. That's not what the Lord God is speaking of. Because he tells us what he's speaking of in verse 9. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now as a member of the family of God, he's not going to do that to me. Okay? But he will do that to his enemies. When, when the father said to the son, here is, your, here is your inheritance, ask of me. I'll give you the nations for an inheritance. And you can rule over them with a rod of iron. You can break them into dashes like, uh, dash them into pieces like a... A, 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 like a potter's vessel. You know, that's not a pretty picture, is it? But God gets glory from that. God gets glory from sending... sending I, I mean, frankly, the Lord gets glory from sending men to hell. Those that have opposed the Lord Jesus Christ, He will execute justice and vengeance upon. 
And can you blame him? I mean, he sent his son to die for these very people that we're talking about. And if they reject his son, what, what, what less would you expect him to do to the enemies of his son? No, I would submit to you that he is fully within his rights to send every person that rejects his son to the pits of, pits of hell forever and ever and ever. And that is, in fact, exactly what he is going to do. Now, if the psalm ended there, it would be a very bleak future for humanity. And indeed, for some it is. For those that have rejected Jesus Christ and have gone on before, it is a bleak present. And for those that are in our world today that reject the Lord Jesus Christ and die without having accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior, it is a bleak future. It is not a funny future. It is, it is not a happy future that they have awaiting them. But the psalm does not end there. Because the psalm ends with an invitation in verses 10 to 12. And what a wonderful invitation it is. And we will skip, for sake of time, verses 10 to 12. When we look at verse number 10, what a wonderful verse this is. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and ye perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. You know, that command to kiss the son may seem a little bit unusual, a little bit strange at first, especially to us in our modern day culture. But you've got to realize that in biblical times, when a king was conquered, he would be brought before the conquering king. And he would, he would be forced basically to kiss the hand of the king that had just conquered him. It was a sign, it was a signal of submission, of homage, of, uh, of, of worship to the conquering uh, king. And the idea here of kissing the son is to do homage to this king. It is to submit to his rule. It is to worship him. It is to obey him. It is to adore him. And again, the alternative is displayed for us here again in verse number 12. Kiss the son lest he be angry. And by the way, before it was the father that was angry, now it's the son that's angry. Kiss the son lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. You know, in life there's really only two paths. There's Christ or chaos. You can either submit to Jesus Christ, you can either follow Him, you can either love Him, you can either trust Him, or you can bring upon yourself chaos. And it's not just you that will bring upon chaos upon yourself. It is Jesus Christ that will bring chaos upon you. It is Jesus Christ that will spend your existence into chaos if you choose not, not to submit to Jesus Christ. And you know there are some, perhaps even here, that have kissed the son, but they've kissed him with the kiss of Judas. They kissed him with the kiss of betrayal. Uh, they, they have the veil of Christianity, of obeisance, of worship, of love, but in their hearts, they have rejected him. They've rejected him. And I, I hope to God that there's nobody like that here. But there's two options either Christ or chaos. Christ or chaos. But the psalm ends with a glorious note. The end of verse 12 says, Blessed are all they that put their trust in Him. And if you're here this morning, whether you are Judas that has kissed Him with the kiss of betrayal, or whether you are here and you've never paid homage to the Lord, you've never submitted your life to Him, you've never trusted Him, becoming part of the kingdom of God is so simple. It is so easy. The instructions are given to us right there at the end of the verse. Blessed are all they that put their trust in Him. One of these days, the King of kings and the Lord of lords will execute justice. He will execute justice and vengeance upon His enemies. But today, He has His arms wide open. And He says, come, trust Me. And if you trust Him... He will not be to you the Lord that executes justice and wrath upon His enemies. But He will be your elder brother. He will be your Savior. He will be your Master. He will be your Lord. He will be your friend. And I can tell you from experience, and really there's a room full of people that can tell you from experience, there is nothing better in this life than to put your trust in Jesus Christ. This is the best decision that I ever made. And if you make the decision today, if you've never made the decision and you make the decision today, I promise you, it will be the best decision of your life.